Hello, Internet. My name is Quentin, and this is Blondie Axe. I'm working on the 1950 Fleischmann steam toy restoration today. I'm going to make the steam feed pipe, which is quite a bit trickier than it might seem. But at the end of that, we're going to get to see this thing run on air for the first time. So let's go. When last we left our little steam toy, it was looking pretty good with its shiny new boiler, but the steam feed pipe is still in a very sorry state. This debris here is the system that gets steam into the cylinder. We need to rebuild all of this. The original had this mounting boss of sorts that threaded into the boiler, and then the feed pipe was soldered into this, and then was routed down to the cylinder. As you can see, a lot of it is broken off because this brass pipe was quite badly desinkified. There's also this little clip that attaches to the valve body, and the purpose of this is to direct the exhaust steam straight up, and I suppose straight down as a result, but uh, I'm not sure why they decided that was necessary to make the steam go up, but they did, so we'll include that. Luckily, I still have that piece. And then the original feed pipe had this little sort of pseudo fitting on the end that slides into the valve body like so, and I believe the factory had soldered that in. There's evidence of solder on the fitting itself. But it was loose when I got it, so I don't actually know for sure. Now this little fitting on the end is quite interesting. We're going to come back to this in a second. But I needed to reproduce this tubing, and so I ordered some copper tubing for this from China. I had to go the long way for this because I couldn't find anything locally or even mail order within the continent anywhere at all. This tubing is so small. It's really, really tiny. It's 1.5 millimeter OD and 1 millimeter ID. And the only thing I could find in that size is what's called capillary tubing. I think it's used in like air conditioning condensers, that kind of thing. So maybe you could order it from a specialist HVAC supplier or something like that. But no normal tubing supplier had this stuff. So I had to wait several weeks to get it on the slow boat. Next, I took a closer look at that little fitting on the end. I assumed it had been pressed into the pipe with dies, the way that flare fittings on brake lines in cars are made. But on closer inspection, there is actually a solder line around the edge of it. So this has not been pressed into the pipe. This is a separate piece that has been soldered onto the pipe. Just the little ring part, the little angled flange on the pipe has been added to it. So once I understood how the original was made, it seemed like a reasonable way to make the replacement. So I got out the brass, went over to the lathe, and I started turning up a very tiny little flared ring. It's a very straightforward part to make, however tiny it may be. Simply drill the hole through the center of it to be a nice close fit over that pipe. A little bit of room for solder, and then I turned it all the way down to the largest diameter that I measured on the factory fitting. And then I want to turn that angled flare on it with a chamfer tool. I assumed initially it was probably 45 degrees, but after I compared it to the original, actually the angle is a little steeper than that, so I made a couple more passes at it until I had an angle and a flange depth that looked like the original. Once I was happy with that, then it was a case of parting this guy off right at the edge where the flare is. You might think the whole end of it is all one fitting. That would have been my guess. It's certainly how a model engineer would have made it, but no, actually the end of that pipe is the pipe itself. So they've just added this little flared ring partway down to act as a stopper in the valve body. There is my version of that tiny little flared ring. So that is going to get silver soldered onto the end of the pipe. You can see if I push that onto the end of the pipe and slide it down the right distance, we end up with something that looks very much like the original would have looked without all of the detritus and solder debris and so on on it. Next, I've had to figure out how to bend this pipe. I tried my standard small tubing bender, of course, initially, but this tubing is so small and so thin-walled that it kinked even with a tubing bender. Granted, the smallest die on my tubing bender is too big for this stuff, so the tubing bender can't really do its job in terms of preventing kinking. The next thought I had then was when people bend larger tubing, like for example roll cages in race cars, one of the things people do to prevent kinking is they fill the tube with sand. And then when you try to bend that tube, the sand inside prevents the kink because the tubing can't deflect inward. It forces the tubing to stretch and form a nice constant radius bend. There are also special benders that can do that, but if you're doing it in your garage, then that is one way to do it. So I thought I would try that. I, that technique doesn't scale down very well, though, because sand is way too big for this tiny, tiny tubing. So I went through my kitchen and looked at all of my powders, and uh, I tried a bunch of them. 
Yeah, I tried baking soda and flour. Things like that were too small. Salt was too coarse. It wouldn't flow down into the pipe. Sugar seemed to be just about right in terms of grain size. I could get it to flow down into the pipe and not get caked up or stuck. So I thought, well, I'll try filling it with sugar and bend it again. See if that helps prevent the kinks. And the answer is not really. You can see it kinked right at the end there. The sugar did help. It's definitely less of a kink, but I'm sure there were still air pockets in there. And without the ends being well sealed, then the sugar is just going to move around. So that didn't really work. Since the fine powders didn't work, I thought, what about some kind of liquid? Maybe if I fill the tube with oil, in principle, again, if the ends are well sealed, then the oil should prevent any compression of the tubing and should not allow the kink to form. This idea might have worked, but as you're probably already guessing, based on the runtime of this segment, it did not. You can see that I got, in fact, a kink that was just as bad as the empty tube, so worse than the sugar. And I think almost certainly there was still some air in there. It's pretty impossible to get it all out. And again, without the ends being firmly sealed, then the oil is just going to shift around and the air is going to compress if there's any air bubbles in there. So none of that worked. So back to basics. I thought, well, let's just try annealing the tube and see what happens. If I make the copper soft enough, then maybe it will tend to stretch before it kinks. And survey says, oh my gosh, that immediately yielded an excellent result. Look at that. That is a beautiful constant radius bend. No kinking, no sugar or oil on the workbench, so that is definitely the way to go. Anneal the pipe. With that problem solved, it's time to look at that mounting fitting on the boiler. This was a little solder boss that the factory had made, so I'm going to replicate that. Again, very simple part. Really quick turning job over on the lathe. This is going to have a 1032 thread on it, even though I now know, as you saw in a recent video in this series, that this was in fact a 2BA thread. But I'm pretty committed to the 1032 at this point, which happens to be sufficiently compatible with 2BA that historians will never know the difference. Unless, they, I guess, they watch this video. Well, we'll just keep this between us. I also did an undercut at the base of the thread to make sure that it will seat firmly down on the boiler bushing. That'll make it look nice and help it seal once there's Loctite 545 on there. And I drill a little through hole all the way through the bushing, and now I can part it off. I do have to flip it around for a second operation because there's going to be a larger diameter partway down the fitting for the pipe to recess into. That holds the pipe in position and gives us a nice place to solder it too. I'm going to hold it in there with some pop can, but of course you lose concentricity when you flip apart in the three jaw, but this is just a plumbing fitting, so it doesn't matter. If you're about to storm into my comments with your caps lock key down asking why all of this stuff is brass, I've answered that question so many times that I have it in my FAQ now as to why it's okay to use brass in the plumbing fittings, but not the boiler bushings or the boiler itself. So there is my version of the factory fitting. In principle, I now have all the pieces to put this together, but I got to figure out how exactly I am going to put this together. To get the length of the tubing correct, I grabbed a piece of stiff copper wire and I formed it into the routing that I wanted for this pipe. For reference, I looked at photos online of other instances of this engine that are in better condition and still have the original steam pipe on them. The factory went straight up into a little U-bend and then down the side of the boiler and across like you see here. That little U-bend might just be convenience of manufacture, or it might actually be acting as a little bit of a steam dryer. Most horizontal boilers have a steam dome on them, a high spot in the boiler, that allows the driest of steam to collect in that high spot. This boiler doesn't have that, but that U-bend might actually help a little bit with that. Or it might be just because that's how they made them. I found the easiest way to cut this tubing was with a fret saw. It's too small for my smallest tubing cutter, and any kind of snips or clippers is going to crush the tube, so a fret saw worked really well. Now I'm ready to solder that little ring on the end of the fitting. Everything was pickled and fluxed, and a little bit of heat and some solder, and we're in business. Luckily my fire bricks are transparent, so you can clearly see this process in action. That went very quickly because everything here is so tiny that very little heat is required to get to silver solder temperature. While I was here, I also annealed this entire tube, now that I know that that is the magic secret sauce for bending this stuff without kinking. 
that went back in the pickling acid to clean everything up. And here I am comparing the factory one to my reproduced fitting, just making sure that it fits the same way as the factory one did. And that is looking pretty good. So I think we are on the right track. Now, as far as installing this, I realize there's a problem. The arched pipe is going to go down like that, and it needs to be soldered into that fitting. But as soon as you do that, you can no longer thread in the fitting. It can't swing around the boiler because the pipe is bent into a U shape. So it's pretty clear what the factory had done was bent the pipe and then soldered it in place as the last step in assembly. So the factory feed pipe cannot be disassembled once that routing is complete. If a model engineer built this, it would be done with a pipe union on the top of that boiler so that you could unthread it and disassemble it and then be able to unthread the boiler bushing. However, I'm going to build it the same way the factory did essentially because I don't want to add a whole bunch of pieces to this system. So I soldered the pipe into the boiler fitting. Then I can thread this whole system into the boiler, but I will only be able to do this once. So I'm putting the Loctite 545 on it now and that will be the last time I am ever able to install this. It might be possible to straighten the tubing back out if I ever have to remove this, but it's likely to break the tubing if I do that. So this is hopefully the last time this pipe ever gets installed. Then I did the pipe routing on the fly with everything in place. This is, again, not how one would do it in model engineering. You would route the pipe off on the bench with a tubing bender and fit it nicely and make it removable and so on, but that is not how the factory did it, so that's not how I'm going to do it. The factory probably soldered both ends of it in place, as I said, at the very end of the manufacture, but I didn't want to do it that way because that would mean silver soldering on the boiler, which is already complete and already clean, and I don't want to hit it with the torch again and so on. So this seemed like a good compromise. Now, I'm not sure how I'm going to hold the end in. I might solder that in place just like the factory did, but for now, I'm just going to set it in there with some spring pressure from the pipe. I then also cleaned up the piston a little bit. It was sticky and dry, so it needed some oil. And that's moving really nicely in there now. The port faces on the valve body were also really gummed up with scunge and old oil and whatever else, so I cleaned all of that up. And now we can get this all reinstalled. In principle now, we should have everything we need to try running this thing on air. I dug through my random steam fittings bin and I found one that had the same thread on it as the whistle. So I removed that, and I'll thread this fitting in here. This is a fitting that I use for testing small steam engines. It has a little barb on the end that allows me to zip tie some silicone tubing onto it for low pressure testing of small engines. The other end of that tubing goes to my low pressure regulator, which then goes to my compressor. Silicone tubing like this is fine to about 20 PSI. Okay, here we go. I started with the regulator at 5 PSI and moved up slowly until I got the engine to run. Of course, it's leaking air out of everywhere because of the loose steam feed pipe and so on, but it should still run. And there it goes, look at that. It's a runner. Somewhere around nine PSI is when it finally started to run, decided that's what it needed. I had to fiddle with the tension nut on the port face as well. Those little tension nuts are really the key to getting wobblers to run right. It has to be just tight enough to make a decent seal on the port face, but not too tight that it's hard for the piston to move. But that seems to be running pretty good. First time in probably decades, who can say? Once again, it has to be said, I can put compressed air into the boiler because that boiler has been hydrostatically tested. And I'm only putting 9 or 10 PSI into that boiler, and it's been hydrostatically tested to 60. As I've said in previous videos, but i got to say it every time, never put compressed air into a pressure vessel that you have not hydrostatically tested to at least twice the amount of compressed air that you're going to put into it. Well, we know it runs on air. That's great progress. The next step will be to get it running on steam. And I want to get the line shaft and some of the attached accessories fixed up and running as well. But that's all the time I have for this week. I hope you enjoyed seeing some life out of this engine. 
Thanks to my patrons for making all this happen, and I will see you next time.